Now we're ready to like do some damage. <laughs> All right. We have we've looked at at two of the main things that we're going to be studying this uh, semester. That is, we looked at uh, ASP.NET controls and we looked at C# -sharp coding. Those are going to be some really heavy duty players in our arsenal. So. What we're going to learn really is we're going to learn more about controls, more about C sharp programming, and eventually we're going to introduce a few other components uh, in, into the mix, uh, things such as master pages. And then sort of the crowning achievement is we'll be doing database stuff with that. But we really have a really solid foundation to start to do some things uh, in this course. So what I want to do today is I want to look at the example we had last time, spend a couple minutes reviewing it, just make sure that you're following it and understanding it and all that. And uh, then go into some other examples. All right? Okay. Anyone started taking classes in the University of Akron Partnership? Okay. I'm going to teach two classes on Saturday, which in May sounded like a great idea to do. Here in August, it really doesn't sound like a good idea, but it's kind of late for that. I wish I would have thought it through like in July. Yes. They cut their, um, their I did. I did see that. Yeah, I did see that they cut their bachelor's and work. Their nursing, and, so. and pardon me. And their nursing. Oh, okay. Wow, really? Yeah. Uh, I did see that they that they cut a number of their programs. Um, yeah, including that. So they they still have the software development, uh, fortunately, um, but. Um, yeah, um, so I'll be teaching in that. Really, here's here's my take on that, because that, that, that wasn't necessarily like great news when I saw that. But my thought is really, um, in the past, web development was sort of viewed as being distinct from software development. You had software development and web development. Now it, it's all software development. Uh, you know, not, nothing you do in software development is, is not going to touch the web. That was a very awkwardly worded statement. I used a double negative. Everything you do in software development is probably going to touch the web at some point. So therefore, to have some background in it is essential. So the, the, the firm split between software and web development is less important now than I think it, it has been in the past. And so, I, you know, I, I think that they're, they're cutting the web development programs probably in reaction to that because their software development people also take web development courses. So, and they also run other aspects of software development, which is, which is beneficial. So that's sort of my take on, on that whole thing. 
Um, that really, web development is sort of just a specialty of software development, just like Java programming would be a specialty, or in a way, even mobile development is just a specialty of software development. It's all software development. It's just like if you go to be a nurse, you know, there's, there's critical care nurses, there's uh, uh, medical floor nurses, there's psychiatric nurses, there's a whole bunch of kinds of nurses, but they're all nurses. Well, in web development, I think that is now being seen more as just sort of a subset of software development. Anyhow, here's what we picked up last time. And I'm going to open up the pages because I, I want to go over creating and I want to go over opening. I think I've gone over creating a few times. So we'll go over it one other time, <laughs> one more time. My brother's like that. My brother will say, oh, did you hear about the Browns game yesterday, for example? I, I don't think the Browns played yesterday, but let's pretend they did. Did the Browns, did you hear about the, how the Browns game yesterday? I'll say yeah, and he'll tell me about it anyhow, all right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I always tell my kid that, that's, his name is Joe. I always tell my kid that's getting Uncle Joe when that happens to you. <laughs> It's like, so like I'll even say like, oh, I Uncle Joe'd you on that one. But it's the same thing. I said we already covered it, but guess what? We're going to cover it again. All right? So I'm going to Uncle Joe you. <laughs> All right. So to create a new website, again, other ways to do it to be sure, but this proves to be the least problematic way. Go to Visual Studio. I hope he doesn't watch my YouTube videos, because I don't think I don't think he knows about that term. You go under File, New, Project. You select from there Web Previous Versions. From there, you select ASP.NET Empty Website. Again. I'm not big on doing things the old way. So this isn't me being old fashioned. This is just that starting off, some of the techniques that you could create a website using the new version gives you a lot of extra stuff that I just don't want to mess with at this point. I want to just keep it simple. So we're going to say just give me an empty website. And when we go into that, it will create it wherever we put it. So we can put it on the desktop or whatever, or on your network drive. Click OK. It goes and creates it for you. then go start making pages. As a general rule, you want to have one page in your application called default.aspx. The reason for that is because if you go and start your application, if you don't specify a page, like for example, if you're clicked on the CSS page or you're somewhere else, it'll try to open up default.aspx. And if that page isn't there, it'll give you an error. All right. So I would always make the first page default.aspx for any of these applications. So I'll go new, file, web form, and give it a name of default.aspx. Make sure C sharp is chosen. Make sure place code in separate file is also chosen. All right. Click add. And you're good to go. Creates it for you. I would suggest that it looks like in this uh, on this machine it doesn't show you your list of files. I would suggest you go to View and add Solution Explorer so that you can see all the files over here. I'm just going to put some 
very dummy code here. Happy Labor Day weekend. I can run it. And away we go. And there's my page. Not much anything exciting on it, just an H1 tag. Happy Labor Day weekend. Okay, so let's say I close this. I've done a lot of work for one day. I've closed this. I want to go open it up. So I go to Visual Studio.
and let's say I'll expand it to website 1A. Notice what it did. It put on the desktop website 1A, but inside of that there's a website 1 folder. So if you're not careful when you go into Visual Studio and open it, if you don't go enough folders deep, then this is going to happen. File, open, website. If I'm not careful and I just say, okay, I want this guy and open it and ignore the fact that there's a folder underneath it, I open it. It'll sort of look like it worked. But when we go to run it, this is sort of a tip off as well. Can't find the web config file. So let's say I create one. And we get an error message. All right. The reason for that is because it can't find all our files, can't find our default ASPX because we're actually in the wrong folder. So it's important that you open the right folder. You can't open a parent folder. So like in this case, website 1A, inside of that is website 1. That's where the bin is. That's where the web config file is. So that should be the folder that you open. That's where all the rest of your uh, folders are. So again, so we end on a, on a high note. Let's go and open up and do this one correctly. File, open, website. We'll navigate down to the right folder. Ah, this is the right one because as been, if we looked out there, it would show web config. We open it. Now we have the run, the debug, and all that, and we can run this. And there we go. All right. Okay, let's take a minute to look at what we had last time. Last time we sort of brought together ASP.NET controls and C Sharp coding. Remember, ASP.NET controls give us controls that live on the server, all right, that we can programmatically do stuff with. So we can access the, the properties of them easily. And they're very richly featured, so we can configure them in a bunch of different ways, all right. We can set the properties, but we can also change the properties via our code. So let's go and let's open up the example we had last time, which I believe was form controls. So let's go and open that guy up. File, open, website, form controls. Ah, this is one of the little nested things. So we don't want to open this one. We want to open up that one. The one that has the bin inside it. We can run it. And this has our Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. So we can type in something, convert it to centigrade. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time formatting this, but you can, you can certainly apply CSS to this to make it look any way that you want to. My suggestion, again, for applying CSS is look at the HTML that gets generated. So view the source. If you do that, you'll see all the tags that get generated the IDs, 
and so on, and then you can write your CSS code to reflect that. Now, we added some validators in. We added two validator controls. One is to validate if there's nothing there. Must enter Fahrenheit temperature. One is if we put something in that's not numeric. Must enter a number. One thing you might notice with the validation controls is, is actually that validation control, the code for that, the code for that error message is always there. All right? Interestingly enough. It's just made visible or invisible based on whether there's an error or not. All right? So if we view source for this, We'll see both error messages are there. Must enter Fahrenheit, must enter a number. But it's simply made invisible or visible depending on whether there's really an error or not. If we want the errors, error message not to take up space, we can do this. And this is something I do almost every time. We can go in and we can set, there's a property for it. How many of you remember the old store for the Apple, the old commercial for the Apple App Store that was always like, there's an app for that. How do I do this? There's an app for that. Well, sort of the, the catchphrase in this class is that there's a property for that. If you want to see how to do something, chances are there's a property on the control that will allow you to customize the way that it acts. And you have a lot of flexibility for that. You have a lot of flexibility in setting those properties to make it however you want it to. And in fact, you can set those properties both in the property inspector and through your code. All right? So I can give the value of a label, all right? But I can change the value of the label through my code. That's effectively what I did here, right? I started out with a label that had uh, no text in it. And then I display the answer um, if there's a, a proper calculation. Okay, so the property that controls whether it takes up the space or not is display. And the display is either static or dynamic. Or none. That's a little more advancing. You can have the individual error messages not display and display a summary instead. If I change that to dynamic, what that means is, is it will only take up space if there's actually an error. So now when I go and run this, if I leave that off, the error message appears. If I type garbage in here, the error message appears. But it doesn't appear somewhere over here. It appears somewhere over here. Okay, so that's what the dynamic display means. Let's review this. In our design mode, we have some labels, a text box, a button, two more labels, and two validation controls. The labels that we are not ever going to address in our program, we are generally not worried about the name of them. We might give them an ID, but we're not worried about those. We're mainly worried about the ones that we're going to change through our code. For example, LBL result. Notice we can set all kinds of properties on these things. We can set a CSS class for them. All right? Oh, hello. Hey, Dad. How's it going? Good. When is your last one over? 12. 25 or 1220. All right. We can, <laughs> we can set our CSS class, all right, for this. So I go in here and let's make a quick CSS file. New file. Style sheet. I can create a CSS rule for dot result. So 
any, any calculations have a result, I can give this class to. And I can do something like font size 1.8m. And then I can go in here for CSS class and say result. It's not showing me that because I haven't added it to the page. So let's go into code view. And link rel equals style sheet. Type equals text CSS, href equals style sheet dot CSS. Now that we brought that in, I can go for this label and I can give it a CSS class of result. Notice it shows me a list of the classes I've defined. All right. And that's really nice. We had talked before about styling it via the ASP.NET attributes or styling it via CSS. Styling it via CSS allows us the advantage of creating classes and creating style rules that are going to get applied on every single page. If I were to go in and set some of these properties, set the border and the, the background color and all that, if I had another element on the site that I wanted to look the same way, I would have to go in and manually set that on every page that had a result. Let's say, for example, I had another page that converted centigrade to Fahrenheit, and I wanted the result to look the same. I would have to go to those pages and manually set those ASP.NET attributes. Well, that sort of defeats the whole purpose of having CSS. The idea of CSS is we can put those style rules in one place, and we can apply them wherever we want to. Another example, errors. I can create a class for the errors. So I can do uh, font weight, bold, color, red, background, yellow. I'm doing this very dramatically, all right, so it's obvious what the error messages are. So I can then go on my default page and I can set the error messages having a CSS class of error. Notice I can select the control two different ways. I can select it in source view or I can select it in design view. So if I'm in design view, I can click on it and it gives me the properties. If I'm in source view, I can do the same thing. I can click on the tag and it shows me the properties. Like I said, first or second day, it's good to know how to get around both in the source view and in the design view. All right. So now I have these things and they have styles associated with them. So if I run this and try to do the calculation, it shows up in the air style. If I display, put in a proper number, the result looks styled differently. We didn't look at the code today. The code simply grabs a value from the text box. Remember, we to, to grab a, an attribute of a object or a control, we have to give the name of the object, control. Uh, the name of it is going to be the ID. All right. I, I, in fact, I shouldn't say name. I should say ID. So we use the ID, a dot, and the name of the property we're interested in. So we're interested in the text property of the... That's what 
txt Fahrenheit.txt means. It means the text property of the control that has an ID of txt Fahrenheit. I think I said format before. I meant Fahrenheit. All right. Convert to double simply goes and makes that a double. Because the text box is literally that. It is a text box. Now, we put validation in to make sure that they put numbers in, right? That doesn't matter. From the compiler's perspective, there still could be a string in that text box, all right? And therefore, we need to convert it to a double for it to work. Once we've converted to a double and have grabbed it, we can apply the formula of 5 ninths times Fahrenheit minus 32. Why did we say 5.0 divided by 9.0? Anyone recall that? Divide two integers. Right. It's going to think, if I divide two integers, it's going to think the answer should be expressed as an integer. So that's an interesting quirk of the way C-sharp works. I would have thought the fact that I'm putting in a double would mean that that's what it would do. It would consider it to be a double, but C-sharp doesn't work that way. If there's integers involved in, uh, like that, it would assume that it's going to be an integer, and therefore, um, up, therefore it's going to create an integer as an output. And 5 ninths, given that 5 ninths is less than 1 half, it's always going to round that to zero. So it's always going to be zero times the temperature. It's going to give me a temperature of zero. Finally, when I'm done, I'm going to place the result into the label's text attribute. All right? Questions about this? All right. Let's have some fun with this. All right? Negative 40 is a magic number in Fahrenheit to centigrade conversions because negative 40 Fahrenheit is also negative 40 Celsius. It just works out that way. All right? So if I run this, negative 40, yay, negative 40. That's a great coincidence, right? We should celebrate that. All right? We should celebrate that by, by putting up some kind of message on the screen saying we have hit the magical number, all right? Um, you are entitled to, I don't know, what would you, should you be entitled to? You're entitled to take a day off work, all right? I'm not your boss. Why do I care if you take a day off work, all right? So let's do that. Let's find an image. I know this is ridiculous, but hey, it's tough coming up with examples that are realistic, all right? So if they can't be realistic at this point, we're just going to make them fun. I'm going to look for magic number, and I'm going to see if there's any images associated with magic number. A figure represented as significant or momentous in a particular context. Yeah, that qualifies. Oh, magic number. I'm going to take this image and I'm going to save the image. And I'm going to put a credit on my page, right? Because we're not thieves, all right? We're following copyright law. So I hope that this comes up with a source that I can put in. All right, we'll wait for that. I'm going to make, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to draw it out on the board real quick. And we'll think about how this is going to work. All right, it's always good to like think about how it's going to work before you go and do it. All right. So I have my page, boring old page, that has the text and has the, the text boxes and has the button 
It has the labels and so on. Here's what I want to do. If they enter in minus 40, I want to display magic number and then have a paragraph that talks about uh, why I called it the magic number, because coincidentally negative 40 is the same for both. And then I'm going to put a credit of where I got the image for. Now, if they don't enter in minus 40, all right, I don't want that to display. How could I do this? Any thoughts on how I could do this? We're going to have to have an if statement in my code behind, right? That's going to look to see if the value of Fahrenheit is minus 40. All right? What are we going to do then? Make a hidden, not hidden. Okay, very good. We're going to have a section of the page that sometimes is visible, sometimes isn't. All right? And if, it's vis if, if our condition is met, if it's minus 40, all right, then uh, we display that hidden section. If we entered something other than minus 40 in, then we don't display it. Now, let's think this through because we could do this by treating each one of these things individually. We could have an image here, we could have a paragraph, and we could have another paragraph. But it'd be nice if we could group all these things into a unit. that we could address like a unit, all right? So that when they entered in the magic number of negative 40, instead of having to specify each one of the things that we want to hide individually, or each one of the things that we want to show individually, we could say, show this whole block or hide this whole block. That's sort of a better way to do it, right? Because what if there was 10 things here, right? Yeah, you're going to like slip up and forget to hide one or something like that. All right. So the whole idea is we're going to make this into a unit that we can just say, show the whole unit, hide the whole unit. That way, if we come in and added a second image, an animated GIF with confetti flying around, because this really is a big deal. All right. At this point, I'm debating if I actually want to do that, because that sounds kind of fun. All right. But if we added something else to it, we wouldn't have to change our code to say, well, now remember to hide the confetti as well. All right would still just hide or show that unit. Now, the control in ASP.NET that allows us to show and hide just a block of code and everything in that block is called a panel. All right? Hint, hint. This might be something for your second homework assignment if you haven't started that one yet, which is due next week. So it's okay if you haven't started it yet. All right? So. I'm going to go and I'm going to make a panel that's going to contain all this cool stuff. So, first thing I'm going to do, though, is here's my image. I have to put my image inside my form control folder. Remember, that's my website's root directory. So to address this image, I have to have it within the root directory. So I'm now going to go to Visual Studio into design mode for this guy. Once I stop debugging, I'm not debugging. Oh. And I'm going to drag a panel onto the page. So I can drag the panel this way. I'll click on do. I could also drag the panel in source view. I want the panel right here. Okay. So there is the panel. All right. I can then go and put between the start and end tag anything I want to. And it will be treated as a unit. I'm going to change the name from panel 1 to panel magic because that's when this appears, when the magic happens. 
All right. By default, I'm going to set the panel magic to not visible. Okay. I'm going to add an image in here. And I'm going to add a paragraph. we have to do is we have to add the image on there. So let's go and drag. Oh, we already dragged the image over. We have to specify the image URL, which is Refresh up here because I dragged something in there. So now the image appears. So I can go to the image URL and I can pick that image and click OK. Notice what the URL says tilde slash magic number logo. 21.png. If it ever shows you a physical path name, like C colon files user blah 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 blah, then something's wrong. It should give me the URL that looks like that. Alright? Um, a relative path to it. Now, one thing that you'll notice, um, some things I'm more concerned about the ID of than others. All right. So I changed the name of the panel to Panel Magic. The idea of the image, I just left at image one. All right. Why do you think I'm concerned about some names rather than others? Because I'm erratic and inconsistent. Yes. Because you may be referencing the ones you want to. Do yeah. For like yeah. Ideally, in a perfect world, you would go and you'd give every one of your IDs a meaningful name. That's what you should, that's best practices. But, minimally, the ones that you're going to reference in code, make sure they have a good name. All right? Like, I don't mind leaving this as, as image one, to be honest, because I'm not going to do anything in my code with that. I'm going to do something with the panel, all right? But I'm not going to do something with the uh, image separately. All right, so let's go into, yes, go ahead. For, uh, for optimization for like searches, would, would IDs for like reading games help with that or no? Good question, probably not. All right, let's go in here and I'm going to say if Fahrenheit could probably do this two ways. I could say if Fahrenheit equals negative 40, or I could say if Fahrenheit equals centigrade. 
I guess I could say if centigrade equals negative 40, so I could do it three ways. Then what do I want to do? I want to make that visible. How do we refer to, how can I make it visible? There's a property for that. Is there a property on the panel for show? There's a property on the panel, not for show, but for visible. So I could say, I called it panel magic dot, and again, this, does, this gives you a list of the, the, the properties and methods. You guys today get all the breaks, right? Back when I walked to school 10 miles both ways uphill, and we used punch cards to write our programs, we didn't have this kind of IntelliSense. But in this case, it is very valuable to have it because these ASP.NET controls have a lot of properties and methods associated with them. There's a lot of controls. There's a lot of properties. You're not going to be able to memorize them all, all right? You're going to know the common ones, but you're not going to know them all. This sort of gives you some little bit of a help. So we can almost look and we could say, I know it's called visible, so I'm scrolling down. We could say visible equals true. Okay, let's run this. Type in 12 degrees, convert to centigrade, there I go. I type in something else. I type in negative 40. Woohoo, I hit the magic number. All right. I type in 32. Ooh. What did I do wrong? You might know or you might not know. Uh, if you know, pretend that you don't know, all right? Because oftentimes your code isn't going to work first time right out of the box. I've been programming. I started programming. Again, this is my time to, to kick back in my rocking chair and reminisce, all right? Let me think for sure. Let me get the date for sure. I started programming in 1976 before some of you were probably born, all right? Maybe before some of your parents were born. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe probably not that long ago, right? I don't know how many times I've written since 1976, which is how many years? 42 years. How many times I got it perfectly right the first time? Probably a handful. Probably five or six in 42 years, all right? You're going to make mistakes, and you're going to, like, forget something or miss something or not dot the I's or cross the T's or something's going to be wrong, all right? Therefore, a very important skill to obtain is the ability to de debug your code, to find out what's wrong with it and fix it in a timely manner, all right? That's one of the reasons we say things like comment your code or use meaningful variable names things like that, because that helps you read your code, and being helped to read your code helps you to change your code, and find the mistakes, and change it, and so on. Now, you may or may not know what's going wrong here, but what I want to show you is I want to show you a systematic way of debugging. Because, generally speaking, there are two ways that you can debug. One of them is to stare at your code and wait for the air to jump up and slap you in the face, all right? That isn't very effective. If you made a mistake, you know, it's kind of like a spelling mistake. If you spell it wrong the first time, you might not notice that it's incorrect the next time, all right? That's why it's nice to have a tool like spell check that points it out, like, oh, okay, uh, 
there is, there, there's, uh, separate has uh, two A's, not two E's, okay? Because maybe you thought, maybe you spelled it wrong, you know, and you're going to could stare at it all day and not notice that it was a spelling mistake unless it was pointed out. So the systematic way to debug in this environment is to run the debugger. And what the debugger involves is setting breakpoints, points in your program where you're going to zoom in and you're going to see the code execute one step at a time. And it's going to actually show you what's going on in the code. So you can watch what the server is doing and a lot of times that will give you insight about what is wrong. So, I don't know exactly where the error is. So I'm going to put the breakpoint here. All right? Because who knows what the error is? One of Zeller's rules is if you don't know what the error is, don't be too sure that you know where the error is at. All right? So in other words, if this isn't working, it's generally good not to say, well, you know, I know these statements are correct, so I'm not going to look at them. You know what? If it's not correct, it's not correct. Probably look at everything until you find it and know for sure. All right? It's kind of like looking for your keys. You know, oh, I know they can't be in the bathroom. Well, until the keys are in your hand, you don't know that they're not in the bathroom. Right? The cat might have picked them up and carried them in there or whatever. So consider every possibility when you're debugging. So I'm putting a breakpoint here. What that means is when I run this in debug mode, when the program gets to that part, when the server gets to this part of the program, it's going to stop and show me the code and allow me to walk through the code a line at a time. I can check the calculations to make sure they're correct. I can uh, check how the if statements work to make sure that the if statements work correct. So let me go through here and debug. Start debug. I'm going to put in negative 40. Click that. It's at this step in the program. I can go through and I can step into. That's F11. Step into goes to the next statement. And we can do things like we could put our mouse over this variable and see the value of it. That's negative 40. Set a grade still has a value of 0 because it's showing me the value of the variable before the statement executes. So if I hit F11 again, then centigrade now has a value of negative 40. So did the calculation correct? And label text currently has nothing. All right. Does Fahrenheit equal centigrade? Yes, it does. It's going to go and make that panel visible. I'm at the end. The panel is visible. Okay, so far so good. I now type another value in. Click this. Same thing happened. I can I can uh, I'm going to say continue. Where is continue? Actually, I'm going to say step over, which means ignore that statement. Okay, now I'm in here, and I'll start my F11s. Declares by that. Grabs a value from the text box. That's correct. It grabbed the value of 21. I do the calculation. Gives me a value of negative 6 point something. The text is currently negative 40. Why is the text negative 40? Why isn't the text blank? Yeah. These server-side controls do something called maintain their state. That means every time you run them, these server-side controls have the old values from the last time the page was ran. So at this point, the last calculation we did, we put a negative 40 in there. So that negative 40 is still there until we do the new calculation. That's really, really, really important to remember. Because if I hit F11, we hit this F statement, Fahrenheit is 21, 
centigrade is negative 6, that condition is false. So we skip right over that statement. We don't set the panel as visible. But the panel is visible, is still visible from the last time we ran this, right? Because these server-side controls maintain their state. Therefore, what we have to do is we need an else statement here. If Fahrenheit equals centigrade, we make it visible. Otherwise, we make it invisible again. And that should solve our problem. Now, maybe you knew that before I ran it through debug. But running things through debug is a good practice to get into uh, because you don't want to sit there staring at it, spinning your wheels. It's good to try to figure out yourself. But there's a certain point where you're just spinning your wheels and you're wasting, wasting time. All right? That's why it's good sometimes just to ask, ask a colleague. Just get a second set of eyes looking at it. A lot of times they can pick up things that you are overlooking. It's also good to run it through debug. In fact, most of the time, if you have a problem with your code, I'm going to ask you if you ran it through debug. All right? Um, you know, gee, this isn't working. Well, what happened when you ran it through debug? And it's a good habit to get into to run it through debug so that you can see. This is sort of an x-ray right into the code, and you can see what's going on. Okay. So I can then... Get rid of this breakpoint, go and continue, and then I could go and fix the problem. showed you this example is I wanted to show you some of the other components, the panel. I also wanted to show you how you can access like any attribute of any control on the page through your code. So, for example, when we enter the magic number, we could make the result text box way bigger if we wanted to. In fact, let's do that. And you can do this a bunch of different ways. This is the way I'm going to do it. If they've entered in the magic number, I'm going to change the class on the result. From result to result magic. And I'm going to make the font size 3M. All right? Now, so I've created a second CSS class. How do you suppose I'm going to go and put that into the code here? If Fahrenheit equals centigrade, what do I want to do? Change the CSS property for the ID. Yeah, change the CSS property for that label. What's the name of the label? LBL result, if I'm not mistaken. One of the properties of that is CSS class. And I'll change it to result magic. And when you add it through default. thinking that we had before, if it's not the magic result, then we want to set the class back to result. So now if we enter in minus 40, We can 
initialize them through the property inspector, through Visual Studio. But we can write our program to change them as well. All right. This is fun. All right. This is fun, right? You're supposed to, you're supposed to start cheering now, right? Yeah, this is fun. But let's try to do a little bit more. Let's try to make it so that we can do conversions. If converting from Fahrenheit to centigrade is fun, imagine how much fun doing both conversions, writing to Fahrenheit to centigrade and centigrade to Fahrenheit is. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I can take that. All right, we're gonna start doing that. We might finish today or we might not finish today. All right, so what would I need to add to the form to give the user the option to convert from Fahrenheit to centigrade? I need some way to select which conversion I wanted to do. Right? How could I do that on an HTML form to give the user the option of converting Fahrenheit to centigrade or centigrade to Fahrenheit? Radio button or text. Radio button, all right. Uh, radio button or drop down probably would be the two. Uh, I wouldn't use a checkbox because the checkbox uh, aren't mutually exclusive and I only want to pick one conversion to do. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to add on my page stop debugging. I'm going to go into the visual. No, I'm not. I'm going to go into the design view. I'm going to add a drop down list. All right. I'm going to change some of these labels. I don't want to say enter temperature in Fahrenheit. I just want to say enter temperature. I don't want to say convert to centigrade. I just want to say convert. And I don't want this to say temperature in centigrade. I want to just say new temperature, converted temperature. Okay. Now, I clicked on, I drug a, a drop down over. By default, the name is drop down list one. I'm going to change it to drop down conversion type. All right. If I click this little arrow, this little arrow means that there's like additional stuff associated with this control. Notice you don't get that with a button, all right, because a button's just a button. But this drop down has a list of options associated with it. So I'm going to click the button and I'm going to say edit items. Later on in the semester, we're going to choose a data source which means that we're going to pull the values for the drop-down from a database. All right? For example, if you were entering student information and you wanted them to select what their major was, well, there's a list of majors, things that you can major in here at LC, right? You, you can't major in anything. You have to major in one of the predefined majors. So there's a finite list of items that you can major in. Rather than having the user type in that free form, we're going to allow them to select from the values of, of majors. And that's going to come from a database table. Well, we're not at that point yet. So we're going to edit the items manually. And that's what this does, edit items. And I can add items. So I can say I want to display that's what the text is, Fahrenheit to centigrade, and the value, I'm going to make FC, Fahrenheit to centigrade. Now, a drop-down always has two things associated, a drop-down option always has two things associated with it. It has what the user sees and what the code behind the scenes sees. Now, if I just said 
FC, and maybe the users would figure out that meant Fahrenheit to centigrade, but maybe not. That's kind of cryptic. So I display something that's intelligible to the users. Fahrenheit to centigrade. The code behind the scenes, on the other hand, is something that my program's going to understand. F to C. F C. So I'm going to add a second one that says centigrade to Fahrenheit. And I'm going to make the value CF. All right. So I now have a drop down that allows me to choose one of those two things. If I run that, I can choose. But guess what? It's still, my code is still only doing Fahrenheit to centigrade. Because just because I added the visual part of it doesn't mean that the coding part works. I have to go and change that. So, I'm going to go into my code behind. And I'm going to have an if statement. If. What do I want to t test at this point? I want to test the value of the dropdown, right? So how do I? How do you think I'm going to test the value of the dropdown? Well, you're real call it close. What do we need first of all? We need the ID, right? Because we want to test the value of the dropdown, not the value of the text box or the value of the button or the value of the label or whatever. So I'm going to say DD conversion type dot, and again, we have our handy list of properties. There is nothing that says value, but there is a field that says selected value. And that's what we want to test, okay? Because really, a dropdown has a bunch of values associated with it, right? For it, you know, it has all, you know, it has a bunch of items. Each item has a value. We're interested specifically in the one that was selected. So if the selected value equals Fahrenheit to centigrade, then we do this processing. We want to do the other processing. And the other processing is going to be very simple. I'm going to say centigrade equals convert to double text box Fahrenheit. Sort of unfortunate that text box is called TXT Fahrenheit because now it can contain both. Uh, we'll make a note to correct that on Tuesday. All right. I'm going to leave it for now. I'm going to say then Fahrenheit equals 9 divided by 5 times centigrade plus 32, and then I'm going to say label results equals Fahrenheit to strain. Now, it should work going both ways because it's going to take the path. If I'm doing Fahrenheit to centigrade, it's going to do this. If I'm doing centigrade to Fahrenheit, it's going to do this. So, how should I test it? I should test it by doing at least one.
conversion both ways. So I'll go and run this. Fahrenheit to centigrade, 212 Fahrenheit equals 100 centigrade. If I do the other conversion, centigrade to Fahrenheit, 100 centigrade equals 212 Fahrenheit. If I put in the magic number either way, it should work and display that. All right, we're going to play around with this a little bit because there's still some more lessons that we can learn from this, but we'll do that uh, Tuesday. I'll go open the lab, and I'll be back here to grab all my files so I can post them to uh, Canvas, and then I'll join you in lab.